What's up, everybody? Back again for the podcast. We had a little break, but all yeah. right, you know who I am, and you are. Hey, what's up? Uh, musings by Marco, and uh, happy to be here again to continue our little chats. Yeah, we're going to have a good time. We're going to touch on some stuff we hit on, but elaborate even further. Uh, but we'll kick it off with, uh, I just discovered this guy named Max Tegmark. He's a professor at MIT, you know, which is uh, widely regarded Pretty as good probably school. the best, yeah, the best of all the technology schools um, in the world. And uh, he is an AI, artificial intelligence expert. So we figured, why not break down some of what he uh, has to say? And uh, we have our own viewpoints on it as well. And that's what makes these conversations uh, cool because me and Marco here don't always agree on everything. But I agree with most of Tegmark, but here, I'll just dive right into it. Okay. okay, so for AI and human interaction, what we're looking for is to have the machines understand our goals, and then number two, adopt our goals, and then number three, as they get more and more advanced and they are going to become smarter than us, how are we able to keep our goals retained in these machines? So what do you think, Marco? You can kick it off. Okay. Um... I think uh, the basics of that is our goals means that um, we uh, our goals are generally things we want to do, uh, and we don't want the AI having its own goals, and uh, that might be harmful to us and our goals. Like Terminator. Like Terminator. <laughs> uh, yeah. So um, I'm. Uh, I lean towards uh, Elon Musk with this, um, where basically it's kind of like you can't control it. Uh, the once the genie's out of the bottle, the, your your only hope is to be uh, integrated in a way biologically. Like there are many organisms uh, in biology that are symbiotic, and they kind of develop and grow in a way where uh, they survive better together than alone. So uh, if we're able to, uh, as we develop artificial intelligence over time, um, because it should, it should take a while to, uh, to, before we're able to get to truly generalized artificial intelligence, um, we should also be uh, improving on um, uh, uh, medicinal technology and uh, brain implants, uh, the, a la Neuralink, and um, so um, if those are progressing side by side, uh, by the time uh, general uh, art artificial intelligence comes around, um, we could have a good link up with it, um, physical yeah, link up reliant. with our brain. And so that, uh, so that we're able to have kind of an even um, uh, uh, level of communication. Um, or maybe if you die, then that means the machine dies as well because it's powering off of your body in some way. That'd be nice. That is, uh, yeah, that would help. Uh, that'd be cool. <laughs> yeah. But it's like if you're connected to the Internet, though, and uh, this thing is all digital, um, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's tricky. It's like how do you stop it from just putting itself on a hard drive somewhere unless it really can't survive unless it shares space in our brain? Maybe it's like our brains are the hard drives, and we have enough yep. extra space to accommodate uh, artificial intelligence, and uh, it's all hardwired. Yeah. One of the issues in the early AI things uh, is what Tegmark brought up in this conversation. You know, we watched the Lex Friedman podcast. He was Lex's first guest, but his later one, he just went on, I don't know, episode 100 and something. Uh, that was even better. But what he saw, talked about was... Uh, autopilots on jet airplanes because remember there was that sicko uh, guy uh, some years back who crashed his plane into the swiss alps and uh basically he auto he was a sicko why well, he wanted to die he was yeah, um, he, with everybody oh. there oh, okay yeah. it's ringing a bell now he had yeah like a hundred some people like mm -hmm. in the passenger jet like over 150 and uh, so he did autopilot into the mountain and the AI doesn't understand your goal, doesn't understand that, oh, hitting that mountain might, might be bad. I don't know if he took control at the last second. After I think he must have because it's yeah. not, it won't let you fly into a mountain. It will give you yeah. all kinds of warnings. I probably... when I heard that. And so, yeah, yeah must have been. 
So uh, basically we gotta have them understand our end goals first, and then it's like, how do you do that with a wide variety of things? Like, I mean, with the, uh, the Tesla cars, I guess you could uh, think, hmm, I guess your end goal is to get there safely at all costs and to keep everybody around you safe. And they program it around that, but there's yeah, more it's a very specific uh, uh, yeah. type of um, artificial intelligence. So that's far away from general. But um, yeah, if you're like in an instance of a car, you just want to yeah. probably the most important thing is don't hit anybody, and it's okay if you're inconvenienced a little bit. But uh, they just want to minimize that inconvenience to the drivers as much as possible so that it's a nice experience and it's helpful. Yep, and um, it's getting closer to that uh, all the time. Uh, have you uh, seen any recent uh, FSD beta videos? No, uh, I got to give you, you sent me. Okay. You, um, you sent I, me the one when it came out within like a day or two, and it was already almost perfected. That was the one where it was having a hard time recognizing motorcycles and if there was a person on a motorcycle or not. Okay. That was, was that in I San saw. Francisco where it's yeah, two guys the in the hills. car? Okay. Yeah, and the, the cameraman in the back recording. That was a pretty guys. good one. I need to give you the Twitter yeah. link for this guy. It's called, um, actually, if you want to write it down, it's um, Whole yeah, Mars. No, it'll be in this. I'll get it. Everybody listening will hear it too. <laughs> All right. Well, it's a uh, Whole Mars catalog uh he's on twitter and he basically his favorite hobby is uh driving around and recording uh, in his tesla in the san francisco area and uh, he kind of speeds it up then he puts some cool music in and uh so it's a nice fun watch and uh and it's impressive a lot of the twisty roads it takes it really looks better than a human driver in a lot of situations yeah, with um, the civilians on the corners and stuff yeah. humans could overlook that if you could if you don't see a guy going right behind a van but the software will catch it every time the sensors yeah and it's jumped imagine. into uh canada now too uh they recently started in canada nice. and um um it's doing okay over there um uh, as far as uh, i've seen um they have it like geofenced where it can't operate in certain areas because the canadian government um yeah. but um the places so where it is allowed with, like with regular consumers who would not yeah. be testers? Yeah, oh, yeah. Wow. Uh, they, uh, they, because everyone who, who's basically paid for it, they want it. You know, they're they're happy to nice. be like unpaid testers in a way. And mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, uh, yeah, the, a couple of them have been getting it, and uh, it's been working uh, pretty well over there. Yeah. Nice. I was going to uh, talk about Tegmark, what, uh, what he says about uh, he invented this term called perceptronium and that's this hypothetical stuff or part sounds like a good would... drug that makes you hyper aware <laughs> like in a sci-fi movie yeah the new <laughs> limitless too he finds perceptronium right. oh yeah it says i have it written down here a hypothetical state of matter that science is unaware of that allows for consciousness to emerge and so he breaks down that protons and neutrons are made up of quirks and it's up quirks and down quirks he compares uh, being made of water bottles or other objects being made of the same stuff. I like to joke around and say the cigarette butts on the street are made of the same stuff as <laughs> if it's lower and funnier. So uh, basically the electrons are separate from those. Though. Some people have so, more in common with the cigarette butts than others. <laughs> definitely. Putin. Looking at you, Putin. Sure, yeah. But, uh, <laughs> So what he's pointing out just how similar it, uh, machines are to us in our makeup. And if yeah. this matter, I don't perceptronium sounds like some kind of quacky stuff, though. I don't like that. Perceptronium, Come like on. perception. Well, perceptronium. Okay, his made-up word. Sorry. Yeah, exactly. He made it up. I'm and, gonna make uh, up one. I'm, I'm calling mine the. the Antonio Montana, yeah, <laughs> tronium. No. Uh, <laughs> Actually, I wouldn't. I would just say, you know, it's a collection of uh, neurons that just get complex enough to the point where sentience kind of emerges is what makes the most sense to me this, from what I've that's seen. That's why he thinks it's going to be possible to put real consciousness, real subjective consciousness into advanced machines eventually. And that's where mm -hmm. we differ because I brought up the near-death experience and the twin studies where it's like there's something that is making you unique that you must have experienced before. 
and you're experiencing uh, outside your body and those near-death experiences. So that's where I disagree. Wait, are, are you saying that the, the near-death experiences and the twin stuff is linked because yeah. the twins are having similar near-death experiences? No, no, no. I'm just saying the twin studies show that no matter how they treat each twin identically that they have certain possible. similarities they have they have differences they have irrational fears that are different they have uh oh, unexplainable yeah. differences well so, i'd say there's just, a simple explanation for all that stuff it could uh, be. it's just well, that yeah. certain things are genetically influenced and some things are environmentally influenced so the ones that are more uh, genetically influenced um those are going to be more similar for them and the things that don't really have much uh, aren't linked to your genetics is going to depend on um, how they grew up. And um, so I mean, they put them different in the same environments. Room, feed them at the same time. They've, they've done this a lot. I didn't. I heard they even did it in Nazi Germany once. That would twice. be cruel and <laughs> non-practical. They can't do that with twin studies. But, but <laughs> oh man, Mengele, Doctor Death. Man, ugh, let's not even go. With they there. mostly kind of tortured people to death and yeah, to see how worse. like the limits of uh, you know Pain. what uh, humans could take before they died. Yep. I don't think they made any really groundbreaking. It was. It was. Stuff. Stuff. They were able to quickly test out, you know, which types of weapons were the most deadly, which, uh, you know, there are yeah. some, or test out really experimental medications, and you don't have to check for, you know, try for safety or, like, animal oh, yeah. trials. You just go directly to people. So, obviously, it <laughs> saves time if you really yep. don't care what happens to them. Oh, uh, oh yeah, this is what I mentioned And your before. death experiences, uh, just to follow up on that, too, is... Um, um, just because people have near-death experiences, um, you can't, um, that's just something that's happening to you, to your mind. You can't, uh, there's no way to observe that, so. Well, um, no, like, they, they, more and more doctors have gone on the record saying they believe it now. Like, I, I mentioned this in our first one, the Pam Reynolds story. She did not see any of these medical instruments at all. She was dead for, oh, I forget what it was. It was either 20-something minutes, I think. And then they brought her back to the body, and she saw every, like, fine detail of what they were doing, and she was able to tell all the people uh, what happened, including the main doctor, where after the others were wrapping up, he started playing music on a piano, and she was able to hear that. Uh, so that, that was later I on. I mean, wouldn't the, the simplest was. explanation just be that some that her senses were still feeding her information? If she well, was in the room, her body was too. in the room after all, though, right? So maybe her brain was, like, constructing a visual representation of from her senses, even though her eyes were closed, but she well, was still, is, it was like, her ears good, weren't plugged, and she, it was such a good or maybe detail, though, she glanced around. Saw, I mean, did they, did they have her eyes, like, taped closed, where she couldn't possibly open them? I don't know that detail, but I know that she had no brain activity, no heart activity whatsoever. And uh, well, obviously, if she had a near-death experience, and then something, then I would say she well, had some. Maybe they just well, couldn't detect it. Well, no, uh, that's what I'm trying to tell you. The rest of this part, uh, she uh, was able to see an instrument that was not even visible when she went into the room, and she described it as like an electronic toothbrush, but it was it was more of a, like a saw that was buzzing her. And so there's that, but there's countless other stories like this too, where one person hovered through like multiple stories of a, a hospital building and saw the a guy flirting with uh, this girl like two stories up, and then they went up there asking if that's what happened, and they admitted to it. And there's stuff like that too. So, mm. and I just think there's a lot of explanations you can find. A lot of it depends yeah, on it it, the, how these stories were told and how evidence was gathered, and if anyone was leading anyone else. And there's a lot of loop of. Um, of uh, places where mistakes can be made, where these could be uh, not uh, not a good uh, source of uh, information. Yeah, and, and there's a tendency because cases. people want to believe this stuff because uh, you know one we're afraid of dying, so we want to believe that that's not the end, and also we want to believe we're special in some way when um, that might not really be the case. So. It's. Uh, I think it's just a natural tendency that you have to fight against that. Uh, that there is something so unique that's not reproducible that we yeah, have. I noticed that in science, a lot of scientists have that uh, everything's dead and nothing happens after after life viewpoint. Like Richard Dawkins, he's like the king of that viewpoint. 
and it's like well it's just occam's just, razor it's just the simplest explanation that's not that well, it's I not mean, that i or other here, people there was nothing before us like if anything when we die we're going to go back into the same state probably than what happened before we were here i, I would think yeah i mean and that's uh if you can't have no experiences of before you came about then i would assume that it would be the same experience as uh when you stop living yeah here I'll, I'll i was gonna go into that uh, consciousness thing about uh the like say if you have an advanced machine that's like say even like the tesla bot like 10.0 or whatever and I'm excited. Yeah, they're uh, they're saying that uh, I don't know Elon time. We always uh, don't expect anything too fast. But if they actually have a <laughs> prototype and they start producing them next year, oh my god! Nice. Uh, so what I was going to say though is like, say if it's like a tenth version of them or whatever, and it's super Ooh. advanced by that point. <laughs> oh yeah. my god! That'd I mean, it, what what like what uh, this. Tegar, Tegmark guy and Lex Friedman were talking about was this the subject right here where does it, how much does it matter to you if something can replicate consciousness while not being conscious like or not having a I guess you could say a soul they didn't use that term but like wouldn't it be more comforting if, if you were having this relationship with like an advanced robot like friendship not like, like sexual or nothing like there's going to be a lot of elderly people who are they're having uh, their being cared for by these robots and it's going to be more uh, elderly gonna, than young the way we're going yeah and so think about it like how much would it matter to you if this robot is not really conscious but it just takes whatever data points it, it just goes to the internet or whatever the data uh knowledge base would be at that time and then it, it just brings back all these human-like responses that comforts you and stuff how, how much could you be un uncomfortable with it not really being conscious like that's what the whole conversation was and I, I found that to be interesting so does it really matter or not it's i think um i think that uh it will be uh it will be a slightly different thing and i wouldn't expect it to be a human being because they're not going to be human beings but that's not to say that they couldn't uh, be helpful in many ways and i'll just uh yeah i would say that let the results speak for themselves so uh if you have uh something that uh you that is able to provide interesting conversation and it actually is able to kind of seem to come up with new ideas and um, is uh, you know genuinely yep. um, uh, it's make it's just as good or better as, as talking to a person yeah make you laugh as uh, it, it, if it if it give uh, it gives you a sense that it has its own you know reactions to things and uh, uh, if it has the equivalent type of emotions uh, where maybe it gets frustrated or not uh, you know, uh, there's yeah. a lot of ways it could go. I mean, that. then again, some people might like the idea of, like, I want this to be something that's really stable and safe, so I don't want it to get to the point where, you know, I need this thing to be there for me all the time, so I don't want it to get angry at me and suddenly you tell me to go fuck myself. You easily. You, yeah. you, you, probably, you change it like a setting in a video game. Right. I'm in the mood for angry mode right now. <laughs> rolling crap at her. <laughs> you or, piece uh, of shit. See, we're doing the same fucking thing every day. <laughs> And I'm sick of you. <laughs> that sounds more like a sexual relation, sex robot type situation, where it's like, like these weirdos. It doesn't have like, to be, treat me, like treat you me said. Horrible. But that's <laughs> a whole, that's a whole nother level to it. So uh, yeah. yeah, it would work for both situations. <laughs> that's pretty funny. Uh, anything else you want to mention about the AI and all this kind of stuff? You got anything else before I move on? I got another subject here. Well, yeah, I mean, AI, I think, is just the uh, most important topic uh, for uh, from now into the near and long-term future. I think it's the, the single thing that's going to have the biggest impact on us. Um, you... Uh, yeah. um, Oh, by the way, uh, depending uh, on how bad climate this. change gets, <laughs> hopefully if, yeah. uh, technology keeps getting, uh, you know, if we keep having more, uh, less carbon emissions and we're able to slow that down, um, artificial intelligence is just, uh, it's going to, uh, 
you know, be everything. it's changed so much about our lives and and yeah. the, the availability of resources and labor and uh, accessibility to information and uh, to professional services. Uh, I mean, if you have your own AI that's really advanced, I mean, that could do, it could be your lawyer, your accountant, your, uh, you know, every single, it could, uh, you know, a People surgeon. Work most of the time. I mean, it's yeah. going to be able to do every really difficult professional service that a human beings have to do right now. So a universal basic income is going to have to arrive and everybody's can just focus on their passions, whatever your passions may be, most people at least. Yeah, utopia. I mean, I think uh, if uh, it gets so good that, uh, and, and we have bots and the cost comes down so much that they're able to gather their own resources and we're able to uh, even move on to other planets, then um, it's like the resources aren't gonna be a limiting factor for us anymore. That's what the limiting factor is now. And oh, yeah. uh, once it's not, then um, it's like, then money even becomes like, uh, phases out as a concept. Like, um, you yeah. know, I really recommend- uh, old, Just in case, I guess. You should check <laughs> out this uh this classic sci-fi series um it's called the culture novels by uh huh, never e heard of it. ian m banks um he wrote uh this uh you know uh, these are like the top awards given for um sci-fi novels i forget what it's called but um so he wrote a series of books um kind of into the far future of humanity with uh, super advanced robotics and artificial intelligence and we become a space faring civilization and it has all these cool um those uh, all those things are really well kind of fleshed out and uh then it plops you in there and you know what it's really a, a, a life would be like in that kind of situation and uh i got turned on it too because of um elon musk said that was one of his favorite book series and i said well i like sci-fi so so I never heard of that either. So I started. Mm -hmm. I'm on the second book in the series now. I kind of, um, they're all over the nice. place, but um, you could do a certain, like I checked Reddit and they said like, read it in this order. Like this is the best kind of order. Cause like, oh, you know, some of the books good. are better than others. Yeah. So uh, one was a player of games. I finished that one already. And that was uh, kind of a strange setup where this culture was totally built around this game that was so complex that it everyone played it to decide uh, their role in government and their job and basically <laughs> whoever wins the game uh, becomes the leader of this galactic civilization like and positive squid game <laughs> yeah, sort of. Um, and uh, so this guy is in the culture, and they're, like, way more advanced. And they send this. He's, like, the best game player because, like, people, yeah, they don't have to do anything. So he's so into games that um, he mm -hmm. uh, he uh, just spends all his time thinking about games. And uh, he's really famous for that. And he gets uh, through a weird situation. He kind of gets, uh, that I won't give away, but uh, he gets sent as, like, a... And, they discover another civilization that isn't as far along as the culture, but it still has other planets that they've colonized. And they're kind of more like us, but they're a little more ahead. So they have like our kind of society and our kind of like, you know, uh, uh, you know, money and like dominating other people and all this stuff. And it's kind of this interesting clash of kind of the two societies. And he's uh, so good at this game that, you know, kind of ends up, uh, well, you know, I won't, I guess I won't uh, say what happens, but, uh, <laughs> they yeah. should make movies of it too, but you could see how the Dune movie barely didn't even get through the first book. My dad was mad about that. Yeah. It sucks having to wait so long for the, for the second part just to finish the first book. Right. Yeah. It's a good movie, but, uh, yeah, it's such a long wait. <laughs> oh, uh, what I was going to say about this, uh, Tegmark guy. He, uh, I don't know if he created it or he's just one of the main uh, directors. I know he's a main director now, but it's called the Future of Life Institute. And the whole point of this uh, organization is to guarantee that humanity is addressing the most uh, dire threats to our existence right now. They have like a short list. You could go to their website right now if you I want, want to have that job. How do I, can I apply? Yeah, oh, it's cool. And Elon <laughs> Musk is an advisor there. And Tegmark is friends with Elon. And uh, so the main threats that they show at the top of their screen is, uh, let me go by memory, nuclear weapons, artificial intelligence, yeah. bio, uh, 
bio warfare or was it just oh, bio yeah. it was biotech in general uh yeah like uh, coronavirus one, did a pretty good number on us a miscellaneous uh, uh any other threat as well and oh climate change was the other big one oh before. yeah mm -hmm. so and you yeah, got your your asteroid your comet comet coming yeah. in and taking out a continent oh that that one's important like the yeah like the comet stuff yeah I, that one surprisingly so, no one talks about them as with everyone's like oh asteroids actually it's comets you gotta worry about because they move really fast and uh, we, they could come out of nowhere we wouldn't have enough time to really do anything and, about it and they could be smaller they couldn't be they might don't have to be big enough to wipe out the whole planet they could just wipe out like you know north america or uh, that'd be horrible and oh, uh, uh, do you remember the yeah. tunguska event it, yeah there's like it was in the black and white uh, era of photography i think that one like was only the size of a bus tiny or the smaller i think it was the size of a bus but maybe oh, it, it was, was smaller than that but the pictures of the tunguska event it makes the whole forest look like toothpicks that got knocked over by a child like it's the, the yeah. whole scale of it just, is just like <laughs> yeah. messed up but uh, and so I'm really happy that this Future of Life uh, Institute uh, exists, and they do the Future of Life Award. Uh, I don't know if they do it every year or just whenever they have somebody worthy. And uh, so remember, in that first podcast of ours, I was talking about the Russian submarine hero. And this Here's year, the they're going to nominate us <laughs> just for having this podcast. Yeah, we're informing the world right before it goes not... viral. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So. All right, yeah, let me get to it. All right, so here, this one is the one that I did not talk about in the first one. I'll get to this story because uh, the Russians, uh, in 1983, this was the false alarm incident. There was a guy named Stanislav Petrov who was a on-duty officer monitoring this uh, horrible, uh, just not horrible, just very inefficient and bad uh, Russian nuclear monitoring. So the whole p purpose of this place was to make sure that they oh, were you could say horrible. Informed. That's fine. All right, yeah, that works too. <laughs> <laughs> to make sure that uh, that the Russia was or the Soviet Union at the time was informed if the United States uh, shot nukes at them. So as he was watching it, one nuke appeared, and he's like, "Oh no." I, and by rule, he was supposed to go and uh, report it to his, uh, you know, his officers above him. Superior officer. But then yeah. get this, five other nukes appear after that on the radar. And so he's thinking six nukes may, may be in the air. And his hunch told him, if I tell my higher ups now, the world may end. And I have a feeling this is a false alarm. And so... You know he what's interesting? Quiet. Sorry, he I just want to ordered. interject so one I'm, second there. A... Is is I wonder if it was a real attack. If if we were gonna do a nuclear strike against Russia, um, how many nukes would we actually send? You know, because that would yeah. help him out if he knew if he knew that like okay, I mean there are interesting. fifty nukes pointed at us, and if they were really gonna try to do a first strike, that would they have to send everything because their goal is to wipe us yeah. out before we can retaliate uh, and they would send true. them all so there would be like so this should be like 50 nukes or 100 nukes coming at us so why would they only send seven that's stupid we would survive when we would retaliate and we'd all wipe each other out yeah. so that would make it them more suspicious total, yeah so uh that but, would be interesting to know yeah that's a good way of thinking about it and also the weird because there was only one at first and then there was five more that came sure. afterwards so wouldn't they have synchronized it better you know like anyways so well, possibly it depends very, on how much time passes and all yeah, that you know, but coming from it's definitely nice that someone who's intelligent and would maybe even think about something like that and know that type of information is watching and also has the uh i know in the story he he, he basically it defies orders to uh, to not uh, launch back and confirm yeah. with other someone else to make sure yeah. that it's not a and mistake, was, right? And it turned out being yeah. a malfunction, like a, an equipment malfunction. So we got yep. very lucky that this guy was intelligent oh, and uh, that's why they give him the self awareness. And you know, imagine if that was just some like guy, like eighteen year old, like just into the military, that's and you know, they horrible. stuck him in that seat, and he was like, "Fuck." Good. yeah russia rules and we're gonna yeah. fuck him up and he was yeah, just happy exactly. to hit that button dumb. you know yeah, yeah dumb kid 
yeah, like who didn't understand the whole, you know, damaging effects. Plus, the nukes were stronger than at, uh, you know, in Japan, the ones that the USA dropped. Uh, yeah. So the second one is it's the submarine crazy. story. That it, oh, about the Japan thing, though. I was just, uh, yeah. I saw, I was reading something about that. Um, I think something came up just about, uh, oh, the... Um, Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I think uh, someone looked at the data of how many people died in uh, the bombing of one of the Japanese cities, but it wasn't a nuclear bomb. The it was bombs. a fire bombing killed they were more people. way worse people. than the nukes. They yeah. killed way more. Yeah, because oh, of, like man. Tokyo, yeah. all their buildings were wood, and uh, they uh, just had it, to start, start the flames, make like a ring, and yeah, everyone was like city. trapped. And so like 100,000 people uh, maybe died with nukes, I'll but it was like... Details near a half a million. History. Okay, but it was yeah. near a half a million died with the fire, and uh, the thing was about uh, well, in like one city, and then in this instance, I think, and um, they were saying uh, that that was the highest like uh, per you know second death rate in human history, where people died yeah. the fastest from something. It was one of the big cities. Uh, yeah, wasn't it one of the big ones? Like I was yeah, wondering oh, how man. close we got with the whole uh, coronavirus thing because um, we have a lot of people dead now and during some spikes we must have got a pretty good like people dying per second you know not that that's good but like just in terms of numbers <laughs> yeah. you know it's like we got to I bet we got up there like remember when uh, in India when uh, they all went into that Ganges River because it was like some religious like th holiday thing so they all oh, go yeah, into that water that's like sewer water it's nasty. and and they're all crowded yeah. Together and they're so close, and, and then like, bodies, like yeah, and a, no, well, a week later they they yeah, then everyone was sick and they're like totally overwhelmed and yeah, they were like in the streets and there's just people all over. They must have been had a pretty high death rate at that point. It reminds me of uh, Seinfeld when George Costanza had to go to India for a wedding and he didn't want to pee because he thought it's some parasite was going to crawl up his junk <laughs> and, uh, and kill him. <laughs> so he's trying to hold it the whole time he was in India. <laughs> uh, I've got, uh, yeah, I feel where he's coming from. That's just, I'm, I'm neurotic oh, too, but here, not about parasites. Some, <laughs> the crazy stories though. So uh, for the fire bombings, there were stories of people like who were in the uh, underground shelters and then they were like getting smoked out and stuff and they were forced to run out under the street the tar in the street was so hot and oh, like melted no. that these guys were like melting into the tar oh. and brutal and also it was so hot the fire bombings alone once that's on you bombings, you can't get it off the tar it sticks was, to you it was boiling Ooh. rivers so even if you wanted to run into a river to try to oh your yourself, streets are boiling are rivers that's the whole way you get around and suddenly they're uh, not so much oh my you god say the streets are boiling rivers? no i said the streets are how you get around and suddenly not so much you know yep. that's your only avenue of escape and if that's a boiling river you're shit out of luck <laughs> yeah exactly so yeah uh, but the, the worst story that i can't get it out of my mind you don't have to listen people if you want to take a two-minute break on this but there was a nuclear, one of the nuclear uh, weapon bombs. The, there was a girl and, and her sister. One of them just so happened to go inside the be uh, bathroom stall, and that stall protected her from the nuclear blast. Uh, and uh, oh, well, great! So that later she could die of radiation poisoning. Well, yeah, but that's not the worst part. The other sister did not have that protection. So when she got out of that uh, that stall and came back to her sister, her sister. Like, she tried grabbing her arm, and her, like, meat just fell right off of her. It, just imagine how horrific that would be, like, ugh, scarring people. And there's, like, a whole book of all these stories because of all the people who lived who were not lucky enough to be in the immediate blast center because I wish I would be in the blast center. You don't want a slow death when it comes to that radiation and all that stuff, man. That's, uh, yeah, same. So, yeah, for Bad sure. Bad way to go. All right, let's get back to the happiness, how the world was saved. <laughs> All right, so I, in the first podcast, Utopia. we uh, I talked about that submarine story. I got the fine details on that story now, and I messed up a little bit on it, but I got the main points right. So Is this it, happened it, in it turn out that actually it was a yellow submarine and it was inhabited by the Beatles? <laughs> yep, and everybody turned into walruses, <laughs> and then the USA just laughed instead of like attacking, and then it was it was all good. All right. So in 1962, it was the Cuban Missile Crisis, and the guy's name, hit this hero, 
his name is Vasily Ar Arkhipov. Vasily Arkhipov. I hope I didn't Vasily, Vasily so, Arkhipov. He was the number two ranking officer, and in order to fire a nuke, you had to have three. So the other two were like, yeah, let's fire the nuke. And then he was the guy with the level head who said no. But what happened was they were in a desperate situation before this happened, uh, before that decision came up, because uh, the, the Navy were, uh, per, the U.S. Navy was pursuing the Russian B-59 uh, nuclear submarine, and they, uh, th so they didn't want to come up. Their batteries ran low in the submarine, and the AC failed, and it was insanely hot, like oh, 120 something degrees, uh, and so they're in desperate times themselves. Basically, uh, Arizona. <laughs> but yeah, but like the humidity of yeah. a submarine. <laughs> yeah, jungle like, Arizona. Uh, Carbon dioxide was up like really bad as well, and so they were in a desperate oh, situation. Oh, then you start your uh, whole yeah, your brain so, starts to go. You make bad decisions. Yeah, I bet you some people even passed out. But what was it? I forget if it was in this instance or another. But the U.S. during the Cold War they created signaling depth chart uh, charges, mm. like the ones that you know the 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 ones. The regular ones will uh, blow up and yeah. take out submarines, but it's, these are just like a signal to, to say, enemy Come on up. We, submarines. We know, yeah, where they say we know where you're at. Come on up, you know. We're mm -hmm. just looking to, uh, for you to identify yourself, or we're not going to attack you or whatever. And uh, so I, I forget if it was in that story or not because I was half asleep when I was hearing that guy talk, the Tegmar guy, but. The U.S. would do alternating depth charges on the left side of it, and then the right, and then the left, and then the right. And then uh, one of the officers in one case, I forget if it was that one I just uh, told you, uh, he was like, they're trying to signal. They're not trying to kill us because they know. <laughs> There's no way they would have hit us by now. Yeah, they dropped they 50 depth charges on our left and right sides for the last five minutes. Yeah. <laughs> so it reminds me of that. But Either they're, re they're all drunk or <laughs> they're trying to signal us. Americans drink a das lot. <laughs> das Boot? You seen Das Boot? Yeah. I think it's probably the most uh, suspenseful movie ever because uh, it's about not good realistic a, depiction of uh, submarine life. Yeah. Yeah, but it was yeah exactly. It, it was the Nazi perspective though, and they're getting hunted by the British. Yeah. And they were trying to be completely quiet at times when the British were above and on the hunt because they knew that they had the general vicinity of where they were at. And you just never know when it was just going to go to hell. And everybody's staring at each other for, like, prolonged minutes of, like, silence as they just have this one guy who's capable of tracking the British uh, uh, boat sounds or battleships and stuff. So, oh, yeah. man. Crazy stuff. Yeah, those were the stories I had. Uh, yeah, it's a wild uh, kind of situation. Yeah. Got anything you want to bring up? I got a, a, a Pluto story I was going to cover, but I was just talking about if you got something to say. Hmm. Uh, we could do that first. Pluto's cool. All right. Yeah, so my grandfather actually saw this online. And he sent it to me, and it was actually a really cool story. So uh, they just discovered that there's these icy volcanoes on Pluto. Yeah, I heard about that. And... Uh, yeah, so that's a sign that they likely have uh, hydrothermal vents that are making it, because it's not like straight ice at the top as well. It shows that there's some heat. Uh, it's like a more of a toothpaste -y subject is what the uh, astrophysicist or uh, the astronomer uh, said. Hmm. And uh, so they see there's no new impact craters, and so that means that there is internal uh, heat inside of Pluto. Uh, and so they don't know how constant the vol uh, volcanic activity it, uh, uh, is, if it's like Earth or not. And so life would need near continual uh, nutrient nutrient uh, resources from those thermal uh, vents like we have them here on Earth. So I don't know. There's a chance we have some life currently on Pluto because of the, the heat of its volcanic activity, despite not being a planet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's yeah, I remember what I said in the other one, bacteria in my first video, I pointed out bacteria on the outside of the International Space Station was able to live for, I think it was three years, and it can get up to temperatures of minus 400 Fahrenheit. And that, that can live. So yeah. we have to expand what we're looking for as far as life goes. All right, go ahead. 
But uh, I think um, it gets to more extreme temperatures um, further away from Earth because the the space station is um, it's still uh, it's, it's still pretty close. pretty close to the surface of the Earth. Um, so they might still get um, a little bit of benefit there. Neil deGrasse Tyson was ripping on them in a Star Talk a little bit. <laughs> on the uh, space station where it's yeah, like... Yeah, he was saying it. Yeah. Hey, they're claiming they're in space. I don't consider that to be space. Yeah, <laughs> like, like if you look at a globe, it's like, yeah, it's like this is a like a nickel's thickness up from the surface. Like, that ain't that impressive. <laughs> yeah, you and know. Chuck was like laughing. You better not tell that to these astronauts and I hope the... <laughs> 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 oh man, they're, they're, they could be so hilarious, those two. Yeah, well, it's just as dangerous if you're on a spacewalk, you know, pretty much. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's cool. I mean, yeah, because uh, as people know, or they may not know, that uh, here deep in our oceans, we have um, some so uh, areas where they're so deep in the ocean that uh, no light uh, penetrates, and um, there are organisms that live in complete darkness, and they just get yeah. a um, heat and uh, some nutrients from these ocean uh, these ocean floor thermal vents. Um, yeah. So um, if it works here, you know, stands the reason that you might have a similar situation someplace else that is um, also um, uh, active in the same way of course um, you don't have the benefit of the medium of water and um, you know our electromagnetic field and um, the shielding effects of being under that water from uh, inter you know galactic you know x-rays and other particles that can yeah. be damaging the dna and all that stuff so um, mars is okay though they said that uh, life could exist under the surface of mars because they, it wouldn't right. be shielded from well the, the dirt rain, would so. basically protect you once you're underground um yeah i wonder, I wonder how much that would affect uh, pluto if it has yeah less dirt or i wonder what the surface is like yeah i mean pretty much any solid uh substance like even ice or and you know we don't know if it's water ice or if it's like you can have other things be frozen like frozen methane or you know something like yeah. that and uh uh i hadn't heard too much specifically like what's going on with pluto but uh i had heard on star talk about um like a, a woman that she studies um ice and she even studies like that there are ice volcanoes on other planets and um my understanding from ice. that was that uh like it didn't even use a heat source it was just like movement of ice uh wow. caused these kind of ice volcanoes or like it was being pressure was used to like shift things around and i don't think it got very hot either but um um yeah i mean it's uh we're always looking for uh, new places where life can exist, and uh, it would be great to find it. But, um, yeah. you know, I think the most important thing is really that um, eventually we're able to uh, to branch out and, uh, you know, kind of guarantee the survival of our species by getting on another oh, yeah. planet like Mars. Big time. And um, then that will give us that little extra safety net in case we get wiped out by comet or nuclear weapons or bioweapons or all those other things on the list. Gamma ray burst. I yeah. think we'll all be screwed if we get one of those, <laughs> even Mars. Some of us probably turn into the Hulk, but uh, then they'd be all right. You know, there was a star system uh, years ago, at least, and I looked at it on Wikipedia. They go back and forth on whether or not uh, it's gonna, there's going to be a gamma ray burst aimed directly right at our solar system or not. And it's like mm. every other year they change their mind, and it's probably not going to happen in our lifetime. But The nice maybe, thing uh, about space <laughs> is how empty it is and like how much you know room there is between everything. So it's really, really hard for us to get hit by anything just because there's so yeah. much room. True. It helps but, us uh, out yeah. a lot. It hurts us from traveling around, but it helps us out with like even when our the our Milky Way galaxy is uh, set to eventually collide with another galaxy, we'll be moving through each other's spaces in you know a great <laughs> amount of time. But even then, whereas there's so much room that You're most like holding that, your hand, yeah, well, ninety nine nine percent no, it'd be like. Uh, it would be almost like two nets made of like bubbles moving through each other, but like they just slide by each other because even when two galaxies collide, really nothing's going to even impact each other in the galaxies because there's so much empty space. Which one is it? Is it uh, which one's going to collide with us? Andromeda was it? 
Uh, Maybe. I mean, that's the closest yeah. one, right? So that would I make forget. sense. I heard that a long time ago. Yeah. yeah like, we're on a collision I don't know course which one, one but it is yeah. going to happen eventually. Yeah, it's happening with us for sure. That's we won't probably be around unless we're in a robot no. body at that point. We'll see. Yeah. Yeah. So when do you think space warfare is really going to come into play? I know they're launching these hypersonic missiles into space and they're coming back down. Stupid. But when, I mean, what it's dumb. Be laser technology shooting down eventually or something. You just shoot yourself in the foot if you try to do anything in space. Like this whole thing with Russia, they um, one of the reasons they did this test, now it's obvious that they blew up a satellite some months before this, uh, they did this uh, invasion against Ukraine. Was it was one of their own satellites, right? I uh, forget, probably. Pretty sure it was but, one of their own. They did it by accident. No, no, they meant to blow up a satellite with some missiles, and it was oh, like a. Did they? Yeah, it was like a show of force, and uh, but as a result, you know, uh, anything you blow up is just going to make this cloud of space debris that's moving at ten thousand miles an hour around our planet, and now it's that's just crazy. harder for to do anything for everyone, and uh, it hurts you, yeah, and it put uh, Russian astronauts on the space station at risk because they had to do an emergency burn to get out of the way of some of this the debris um, you hear the russians are no longer working with the international space station they've just pulled out it was just announced uh, yesterday or today i just really? saw that oh yeah because i had just heard that uh, they, they they're still the all together on there yeah i just saw this so they announced it until all the sanctions are, are removed they, they, he, they called it the ukraine sanctions so i'm guessing that means the you sent uh, the sanctions by Ukraine and the U.S. and all the European allies, so I have a feeling. So that I mean, yeah, whatever. It's just break. something they could do. You know, they're kind of grasping at straws here. Did you hear so. the 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 threat that Putin gave? He gave a ultimatum to the West, saying uh, he's not pumping any more oil to the. Uh, I guess Europe is still accepting his oil because it's they have no other choice at this point. He said we're going to shut down all the oil unless you guys unfreeze our bank accounts and then the west said no basically and april 1st it was yesterday was the deadline and uh then they said april like, fools, april fools. <laughs> april fools. <laughs> and then they they didn't stop that at all and so yeah, yeah. They it's not like it doesn't road. hurt them either I, you know yeah. yeah oh i got a, a russia update section here all the craziest stuff i've heard more crazy war stuff oh, yeah. I like my history. Right here, here's a couple of things I just thought of. One, um, uh, there's reports of um, Russians being poisoned by Ukrainian people, giving them poison alcohol and food. Yeah, just uh, leaving in the supermarkets or something. Cause or maybe they'll, uh, well, I don't know exactly how they, maybe they give it to them. Maybe it's super, you know, that would be risky because anyone can get it from a supermarket, but probably give it to them more directly. So they're it, really, so regular sense. people are going gorilla against them. Yeah, the re and also I guess it, Molotovs are being thrown at them and stuff. But the reason I said that is because there's video footage of the Russian troops being under uh, supplied and uh, raiding supermarkets on camera, and they got the camera footage, and the Russians are looking like flash mobs in Chicago, just grabbing everything. And Black uh, Friday sale. <laughs> <laughs> and one new TV. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, best price is free. <laughs> So this is the craziest stuff I heard. <clears throat> Fleeing uh, Russians have now been booby trapping uh, in the key. They were in the Kiev area. It used to be Kiev, and everybody's calling it Kiev, so it's hard to make the switch. Hmm. But in Kiev, where they had is to, that the right way to say it? Kiev. It is now Kiev now. Uh. It would depending on the pronunciation. Before years ago, people were using a different one, but now All it's right. Kiev. I can get on board. Uh, Kiev. All right. Yeah, I don't like it. I still like Kiev. We ne cool. No one likes change. <laughs> yeah. Don't Pluto Pluto is a planet holdouts are angry too. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, Hold that grudge for a while now. So the Russians in that whole area they were booby trapping homes, abandoned homes, mining everywhere. So uh people are just blowing up if you try to walk down the street over there. Uh they're booby trapping dead bodies. So when uh, people mm. are trying to get the bodies off the street, they blow up along with the dead bodies. Mm. Uh, They've kit like according to the Ukrainian uh, war ministry, I think it was, or the government. Basically, this is what the craziest one. They claim that 
the Russians have been kidnapping children and bringing them back to Russia. I heard from one lady on TV that, that she knew of two of them. So I looked it up, and the Ukrainians are, say, Ukrainians are saying 2,389 children have been kidnapped and brought back to Russia. That's just crazy if that— but they've been exaggerating the numbers for morale purposes mm -hmm. on both sides. So I would, uh, I would bet that it's lower than— it's there are all these kind of sick, crazy things that you know you take people take advantage of in wartime, yeah. where you know this, the, prostitution, the old... sex trafficking, yeah. rape, you know, stealing things. Wouldn't be surprised but, if there's some use for children. Well, yeah, the, and there's easy access to children. That's what I was about to say next, because there was orphanages where the kids had nowhere to go, and the adults all bailed because of the war, and the kids didn't even understand what was going on, and so you had older kids caring for younger kids and stuff. And hopefully, the Russians, if hopefully, if the Russians were taking the orphans, they were you know treating them well, getting them homes. That least, should but. be a movie with a happy ending, though. You know, yeah. <laughs> like some orphanage where the older like kids are yeah. taking care of them and they are yeah, able to like to make it out Hunger alive. Games. Well, like a couple, of, but that's or, like a fantasy thing. This would no, be like you know, this is a true yeah. story. It's based on a true yeah, story, yeah. and they're able to. Oh, no, yeah. just going for the vibe. You know? Yeah, no, but Arts actually, it could be like uh, that. Would be cool. Like uh, uh, I like those where you have a group of friends. You know, also so they're a group of yeah. friends, and then they. This, this whole thing happens and then you have their own quirky personality types and yeah, then they're like group. yeah well and they realize they have to get out of there and uh like you have some people are like really good and smart about it and they make their way and they got to go by all these mines and like uh booby trapped uh -huh. corpses and stuff and <laughs> they have to make them they get out of <laughs> successfully get out of ukraine that would Crazy. be nice yeah um, Maybe one of them like picks up a rifle and like ends up killing like a Russian soldier and he's all traumatized, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we could explain the horrors worried. of war a little bit. It seems like it would be better as an anime because like <laughs> anime. Oh, uh, you could go and say the insane, anime fight. style. They could go like they could all become like hardened killers and they become like an elite squad. Of, Somebody like, goes super saiyan. Russian <laughs> <laughs> yeah, why not? Yeah, they could like lay into like psychic abilities. They go like uh, Akira style. <laughs> oh man! All right, and so I was gonna say about this whole invasion in general. This isn't the first time Russia's did this because Chechnya, where all these hardcore UFC fighters have been coming out of uh, lately. They wanted years ago to be separate from Russia. I believe it was uh, when the Soviet Union uh, fell uh, some years later. No, it was in the 99 into the 2000, I, th I believe it was. And uh, so Russia invaded them similar to Ukraine where they just showed up and there was this really bloody like year or two of uh, total war. You know, I got and, some interesting uh, context on this whole like uh, yeah. the people are want to be declaring independence suddenly, you know, uh, conveniently all around Russia's borders or all these countries conveniently are like, oh yeah, we're, we are independent and we want to join Russia. You know, this is not, leave Russia. The, yeah, or, <laughs> yeah, uh, well, no, I mean to, for, to, for people want to join Russia. Uh, maybe that's not what you're, I thought that's what you're talking about. No, no, it was, uh, Chechnya wanted to be separate from Russia. Oh, okay. and So Russia was like, hey, you were just in our territory a little bit ago. We, you, we still own you. And this was like a really small, uh, I guess you could call it a country at that time. But where they uh, leave, but that was it because the Soviet Union, obviously all these countries used to be part of the Soviet Union, but as yeah, Russia exactly. afterwards, they they weren't right yeah well no no I, so it's not really that they're exactly, part of russia yeah. already and they want to break away they just want to maintain their independence kind of like ukraine right yeah it was after the soviet union i just i forget the exact details and oh, like okay. if they decided to do that uh well, that right makes away more or sense. they waited years yeah but yeah so well yeah. all right so then well it kind of fits in then still will depend on exactly the details yeah. there but in context um i had heard, heard this uh with ukraine that um Whenever um, the Russia's always wanted to have influence in these neighboring countries, and uh, historically they've done um, these kind of uh, they put in puppet governments where uh, yep. they they run the government. And uh, same thing happened in Ukraine. Um, they had um, uh, Yak Yakanovo Yakanovich Yakano something like that. I think that's what yeah. Say it. So he so he was uh, basically uh, did he was working with Russia and um, 
um, they um, he was in Ukraine for a while, and uh, then he got ousted. And within yeah. uh, a week of him being ousted from Ukraine, and they, in, uh, they elected their own uh, legitimate leader who wasn't a puppet of Russia, within a week, uh, Russia yeah, yeah. suddenly in Crimea, suddenly there was this, uh, well, we want to be independent and join Russia. And uh, the deal there is that Russia sent in military forces, and they occupied their, their government buildings buildings and they claim to be wow. that we want to be independent and all that and uh, the whole thing happened within a month after as soon as that Yakino guy was out suddenly there was this reason to uh, invade Crimea and uh, support their independence uh, yeah. and wow. uh, it's just that when when the, they don't when their political uh, efforts fail and they don't have their puppet government then they've gone and invaded and they've been doing this for decades uh, for yeah. 20 years on uh, 30 years and uh, but that's so what they did in, in, in retrospect if you study it it's I guess it's obvious that uh, this would happen yeah. So, but this Chechnya country is like basically right above Georgia, the country of Georgia. Yeah, Georgia is similar to Ukraine too, right? Where uh, they also wanted to uh, stay independent. And uh, uh, yeah, I forgot if they were yeah. even a part of it originally. Yeah. But, uh, no, yeah, they have uh, tensions as well. I see. Oh, okay. Yeah, like Georgia is right next door. So yeah. So, anyways, that bloody war happened, and uh, this awesome ufc fighter who i thought the fight was today but it's a week from now uh, the uh man it's so hard to say his name amzat chimeyev or chimeyev chimeyev yeah. but this guy he's only taken one punch in four fights and you now we, he's like on the fast track to becoming champion and it's like he's had the fastest rise like I can't think of anybody who's had a faster rise like in this much hype. It's been pretty cool to check it out. I've been watching documentaries and interviews with them. He's like so intense in the ring where he's like, I kill everybody. I'll kill. Like tell <laughs> It's Jesus. super hilarious. He, he's so intense. Oh, in 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 the <laughs> one of like the a psychopath. Fight. I guess yeah. that's good for UFC though. <laughs> But he could be calm and joke around sometimes too. So when he gets, mm -hmm. he can go crazy like that. But the funniest thing is, he was wrestling with this guy, and as he was wrestling this pro wrestler, he had he was grabbing like a bear hug from behind, and he he seen the uh, UFC uh, head Dana White in the crowd, not watching on his cell phone. So he brings him and starts yelling at Dana White, "Hey, what are you doing?" <laughs> Pay attention. <laughs> yeah, and then he just uh... finished this guy off in short work right afterwards, and he literally walked at this guy like four steps like casually like, <laughs> these, these Chechens man they, they grew up in the hardest uh, conditions because of the Russians and these wars and he grew up uh, fighting in the streets and poverty and uh, yeah, wrestling doesn't make the best fighters always yeah yeah, and then they were immigrants that moved to Sweden, and that's where his uh, family's based out of now, and he fights out of there, too. But he became a, a top wrestler, but there was no big money in wrestling. The money was in the UFC. He saw, you know, Conor McGregor and saw that, hey, I can do this. He was already, like, like, like undefeated wrestler or something like crazy like that, a multi-time champion. And so, yeah, it's really nuts. And, oh, yeah, Putin... Uh, Yeltsin started this whole uh, Chechnya thing, and then Putin took over in about five or six months. And then the main, uh, the main like war period after that was another like five or six months that Putin was in charge of. And I got something so. on the sports thing because uh, I was uh, came across an yeah. old Bulls video recently on YouTube, and uh, it was about uh, how uh, how much Rodman used to piss off Shaq. And uh, showed some of the Bulls <laughs> yeah, versus so Lakers games, and basically Rodman was like all over Shaq and fouled the the hell out of this him. This is a Rodman jersey, people. Uh, nice. Can't see it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So uh, he would, uh, you know, he'd have to be really uh, physical with him to foul him because Shaq's a big guy. So he'd have to like <laughs> basically jump on top of him and shove him down when he's going up for like a, a layup or whatever, and uh, <laughs> and really pissed off Shaq. So you have a 
it's funny watching these videos where Shaq's, you know, shoving him back and uh, they're getting all heated, yelling at oh, each other, and his teammates are holding Rodman back and they pull him back and they all fall down and start laughing and uh, or Shaq gets angry and just, like holds Rodman's foot and like trips him up and it's you know. hilarious. After watching Rodman's clips again, I, like I had to get this jersey above any, any other because uh, I like it how he would do all these little cheap shots and then like the, the, he would do them so subtly <laughs> pretend that, that the nothing happened. Could not see him. Most of the time, the refs couldn't even see him. And then next thing you know, the other guys retaliating and then Rodman plays like. <laughs> Why? What's what's this guy's problem? <laughs> Jesus! What a crazy man! So great. So yeah. my next video, I already put that up on uh, Facebook. I was gonna make a Dennis Rodman tribute video. I was gonna gather all of the uh, the most. Oh yeah, that's Dennis good stuff. stuff. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot and of good I was footage put out it all there. Together. Yeah, and it, like I was just watching like some a couple hours of it, just laughing uh, like a couple weeks back, and uh, maybe the algorithm yeah, like, was hitting up both of us. <laughs> um, yeah, there's a there's a, a huge guy. I forget was it George Carousel or something like that. This guy was like the tallest guy in the league, and uh, they had Rodman guarding him instead of the center of the Bulls because Rodman was their best defender, and he was just a freak of nature. Yeah. And, uh, so he he would be like so brutal with this carousel guy and uh oh man he was like so outmatched size wise and like carousel was getting pissed there's so many of these great you ones you could just uh, retaliate by doing illegal things <laughs> yeah or one time or rodman was like smacking somebody's ass just to piss him off like i like think he was hitting on them and then you know, i forget who it was it might have been kevin garner yeah, he was a master at pissing off the enemy team when yeah. they would make mistakes because they're so angry yep. and that's what he said in one of the interviews you go find the funniest moments of rodman he goes i get paid to rebound and to get in them heads <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. And like, I like it how every time he would get ejected from a game in the United Center, he'd rip his jersey off and throw it to the crowd. You get there's like a, like every time, and then everybody gives Rodman a standing ovation as he's getting kicked out of the games. There was never a player like Rodman, but another part of him, the the you know he was a messed up guy with a hard life. And uh, in the, his Hall of Fame exception, uh, accepting speech, it was like the most uh, heartfelt thing you'll ever see, where he's like apologizing to his wife and his kids for not being better. And he's like, to the NBA, thank you for having me even in the building. <laughs> he kicks off that thing with that, because he's been in so much trouble. And he was like, if you don't like how I play, kick me out of the league. Yeah. <laughs> you know, he would say stuff like that. And he was just the craziest guy. You gotta look at actions though, like if his behavior actually yeah. changed afterwards, or he just said that and he kept doing the same stuff, you know. But yeah. uh, sticking on the clothes stuff, uh, since we took uh, care of your shirt uh, about your hat, uh, it kind of yeah. relates to sports too. So, like in the Attack on Titan anime, uh, you the had scouts. this is the Scouts. Yeah, you had um, that Annie where uh, she was trained by her father since she was young in uh, Muay Thai, yeah. kind of like martial arts. Yeah, real good. And uh, she that was her backstory where uh, she was an orphan uh, because it's not of spoil too much though. Yeah, I mean yeah. it's 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 been out for since two for ten years now. You know, yeah, it's Attack on Titan has been a little bit. Of, yeah, if you don't want to hear about it, but if you haven't, then forward. you know, crawl out of your rock because uh, Attack on Titan has <laughs> been one of the best <laughs> animes around just for over a live. decade now. All right, well, all right, a decade. Yes, it's crazy how long ago it started. I think in 2007 that started. Wow, I didn't even know that. I thought yeah, it was like pretty new. It's been a long time. Uh, but uh, there's yeah, there's only two episodes left, right? To no, there's out. only one episode left. Oh, We're on cool. the final episode is coming out. Yeah. Man. I don't know how uh, they're going to be able to wrap it up. I read a little bit. I never read the written yeah, material, the manga. I never read that. Yeah, but uh, from research I was doing, uh, I wanted to see hear, hear a little bit about it. And they were like, there's like, if they crammed it all into one final episode, that would be way more chapters of the manga than they've ever done for one episode before. So it seems difficult that they would do that. So maybe there will be more episodes, even though they announced it's going to be the final oh, episode. Okay. So yeah. that, that might happen because I guess there's a lot more. It seems like it would be hard with where yeah, it left off to like, really wrap everything up uh, yeah, with like one episode. Storylines going on. And those episodes fly by. Yeah, those episodes fly yeah. by. 
if they're like yeah they're it's only like 20 minutes of yeah, content sometimes yeah. it's only like 10 minutes if they do long uh you know intros and uh and prologues and all that stuff they do that trick sometimes mm -hmm. but yeah oh, so wow. that character annie she was raised by her father uh, she was an orphan when she was young because of her race uh, with mingling between two different kinds of people it was almost like a nazi like you get nazi imprisonment vibes with how that country's yeah. run yeah yeah and uh, she was like from the jewish side would be in the uh, analogy and um so she was orphaned and this guy found her and he was like a martial artist and you could train kids up in the military and if they got accepted into this special program then uh, you were set for life like you got your status went up up and you got better living conditions and uh, more money and all these things. Plot, so yeah, it's tiny like a, little thing. A major spoiler or nothing. Yeah. So just, this yeah. just shows you how in depth the plot is. Yeah. So. so and so as he does that, so he's like really brutal with her and trains her to uh, to be this uh, hardcore uh, uh, martial arts athlete from a very young age and uh, is never you know she's soft with her, never shows any emotions with her really and. Uh, uh, she ends up hating him, yeah. and she eventually uh, she gets so good that she much, that she beats him up one day, and uh, <laughs> like and um, yeah. so and then the, she does she does part. yeah she gets accepted. I recently rewatched the whole series, and oh. uh, she uh, she gets accepted, and she's getting sent off on this long mission. They won't see her for a long time. All right, all right. And on the day, <laughs> hey, we said spoilers, so no, we said right. spoilers. So if they want to watch, don't watch. Um, and um, so, uh, and on the but of the final day, she's getting sent on a long mission. Um, he uh, breaks down and starts crying and says, "You know, uh, I'm sorry. That wasn't the right thing to do. But I, but I think of myself as your father, and uh, you know, I love you, and just come home safe. And uh, you know, that changed her whole like attitude." And because she never really, she still played off like she never cared about anything, but she, then she had that in the back of her mind. That was like a strong character motivation. Yeah, because, I mean, that's like, such, that was a, a side plot thing. And yeah, all right, that's just I'm one, well, yeah, one yeah. out of like I mean, 12 main characters, sort of. Yeah, there's, I can't uh, believe how in-depth it is. It's awesome. Yeah. But, uh. Uh, uh, I was going to say, that, did you see Joe Biden and Jill Biden the other day? They were revealing the new US, uh, USS Delaware nuclear-powered submarine. This was like a submarine project that was uh, in the works for like ever since uh, he was the vice president. Are those the ones that are getting sold to France? No. This one is just going to be stationed here. It can be used for 30 years without refueling a single time because it's nuclear powered. Mm -hmm. This is not going to launch nukes, but they, it's longer than a football field. Uh, can go at depths 800 feet and, and under and be like very, very silent. Uh, it can shoot Tomahawk missiles, which are the kind that you're underwater when they launch and then they launch into the air and then start using the jets. And these tomahawks are capable of flying many, many states over, like three, four states over. Like if you shoot it from the water, it's crazy how far these things can go. And then they have these uh, 21, oh, you, I think we can have like up yeah. to seven tomahawks. Uh, we can have uh, 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 21 large bright green torpedoes. I was like, why would they be light green? And then I, I hit me. They track where the torpedo is, and that you could see it better visually if it's light green, I would imagine. So that way you know how to adjust your course, uh, like your aim, I mean, for the next shot, maybe. That's the only solution I can think of. Because hmm. the, the enemies probably aren't going to be seeing it coming. And so it seems more likely that, you know, if you're able to track your own torpedoes, you, uh, how much you miss by and stuff, you'd be able to. I don't think they rely it. too much on vision in submarines, but. Well, I know they have it to a degree, at least. Yeah, I mean, it could well, be really murky water. You, yeah, when you start to get deeper, it's not good. visibility isn't good. That's why they use uh, radar and sonar and all that. Well, for torpedoes, most of the time you're attacking targets like ships that are on the surface, so you got better visibility. So I'm thinking maybe a time like that. But I mean, 
submarine on submarine battles. I don't even know if mm-hmm. I've like I can't even think of a specific one. But so what was uh, what was interesting about it? Just the specs, like impressive, like oh yeah. Well, yeah, I mean it could cool be thing. underwater. Yeah, that was about it. But it's also they were doing this at a time of like heightened tension with Russia too, kind of like right. signaling how powerful it is. But that blew my mind. Thirty years of use. And you don't have to refuel once. <laughs> yeah. That's pretty awesome. It is awesome. It's kind of sad and at the same time that so much money has to go into this stuff to, uh, yeah. you know, uh, to maybe to some degree it's necessary. But, uh, you know, that money could be. How much would it be... melt down if somebody blew it up and it hit the nuclear part? I wonder how bad of a meltdown it would be for the oceans, though. Like that aspect of it. Yeah, I, I mean, I yeah, I don't know what they use, but that's got to be uh, it's got to be a huge risk if a nuclear submarine goes down. It's just in the ocean. You would think it's just going to leak uh, radioactive material uh, into the ocean for for a long, long time. Oh, and it said it would go at thirty miles an hour silently or near silently. Yeah. So I wonder. It's probably you don't have that engine noise firing like you would have on a regular submarine, unless the nuclear ones are louder. It seems they they'd be quieter. Yeah, the specs are cool, but when I hear it, I think of like, man, so much money went into this, and it's a huge risk to us as well as mm-hmm. to other people. Just to like the whole yeah. oceans with a nuclear power submarine going out there that's supposed to be engaged in yeah. warfare. I mean, you had this scare with Ukraine where they were around a nuclear power plant and uh, firing Chernobyl, and stuff. It? Yeah, I think. Oh, yeah, the other one. There, there was, was another, another one. one. It's a big one. Yeah. And, and they then took there's, it over. there's some yeah. reports that some of these Russians got radiation poisoning and sickness and they were going home with the. Uh, that was know, from around Chernobyl, though, I believe. The Chernobyl area is where they left with the radiation issue going on. Oh, it's, a, it's an active power plant. I think Chernobyl is still active, parts of it. So uh, whatever that hmm. was. I've seen but. the urban explorers wandering around there, and it looks pretty abandoned. Like, uh, I think because the active one, uh, it was the, wasn't it the biggest power supplier to like a huge amount of uh, Europe? Not only just uh, Ukraine, it was like a really big one. And the uh, uh, Russians, I think it was just hit. for Russia, but uh, or to, for the Ukraine uh, one was okay. ju- also just Ukraine. It's not for uh, okay, yeah. Because what the uh, okay, maybe it was the entire Ukraine, but uh, the Russians, uh, I forget what they use, like RPG or whatever they use to blow up. They knew which one was not functioning right at the time. It not functioning. It wasn't in service. They had it shut down on purpose. They were going to be cleaning it and then reinitiating it, I guess. Yeah. And that's well, the one that was hit to show they meant business. Then they but it's a huge it. risk. So the point is oh, that, like, it. it's dangerous. Yeah. It's a huge risk. And, you know, that's also a huge risk. When you put nuclear stuff see. into, you know, into warfare or in any places, you know, that's not even a, a attack thing. That's but just, you know. I'm just fascinated by it. That's why I like to talk about it. Yeah. But the Russians then surrounded the place and then forced the employees to stay there and keep the, uh, the facility running as the Russians were occupying it afterwards. Right. And so I don't right. know what their goal was in that. But, oh, yeah, so it looks well, like the Russians, they went back east because they had su- uh, supply chain shortages and they wanted to regroup and reassess. And the, there's a bunch of fresh troops in Russia about to come in, it looks like. So the West is warning, this isn't a retreat. This is a regroup, and uh, they're going to do some other strategy based on what weaknesses they discovered so man it's still looking really tough on ukraine right now so yeah well, also, there'll Ukraine's be more like- to talk about as time goes on it seems like they're doing yeah. kind of well though much better than people expected yeah and oh, i hope better. them the Russia. best and uh yeah. i'm starting to get tired so uh why don't we uh wind it down yeah. and uh we'll uh have a All good right. night and we can uh, pick this up uh next week Sounds so, good. Um, Make sure if there's anything else, or, or do you want to mention anything else? No, I'm good. You know, we're over an hour. I'm just getting a little tired. So, uh, all right, but, cool. Yeah, it's yeah. been nice talking with you. And yeah, um, you too. This we'll we'll hit this really up. Cool. Uh, next weekend or whatever, I'll I'll get whatever editing, add some pictures in like normal, and uh, sounds good. Yeah, well, get pleasure seeing Probably. you, and hopefully you people who watch this uh, had. Uh, it's found something interesting. Uh, maybe down the road we'll uh, clip some of this and have some short sections as well that are maybe more interesting. And uh, maybe if you like those, you. Uh, feel free to share them with other people. And uh, that way it's more approachable than like an hour-long thing for, you know, people you don't know. 
So we could do Lex uh, Friedman chapter style. We could show on the little timeline. Yeah, or, yeah, that's easy to do. Uh, you just have to uh, add that into the description with timestamps with just a certain format. So yeah, you could do that on uh, our also, channels. We're aiming to have this come out every Monday. So we're gonna record one day on a weekend and right. then i get it done and monday hopefully by the afternoon everything will be good and uploaded already so try to aim for mondays probably around three central time is probably what the timing would work out too so yeah. all right cool make it easy and you have a good night as well have a good night everybody uh you know share this with people if you like uh subscribe yeah, like and subscribe all that good stuff yeah look look forward to uh more of these coming more uh yeah in a schedule so all yeah. right take it easy all right later